So we actually have right now um, just under 6,000 hours of archived material. Oh. And welcome back, and I was really excited this morning to welcome to the Short Vol Show, Mr. Don Kaufman from Theotrade. Welcome, Don. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now, it's got to be uh, kind of early out there. In, uh, are you in Scottsdale? Is that where you're at? I am. It's Well, it's not too early. It's 9 o'clock. You know? yeah. Our market, though, you know, bell goes off here at about 6.30. I usually start my day at about 5 a.m. It's not uh, not too bad. And, you know, you're done, though, by 1 o'clock. You can't go wrong with that. Nice. Yeah, I had that. I, w I worked my first option trading job was at the P-Coast in San Francisco, so I'm familiar with that schedule. The, on the only hard part is for me was Sunday nights, like having to go to bed a little early on Sunday nights so that I could be ready for the Monday morning, of course. Yeah, I uh, well, I have three little kids, so I gave up sleeping. Oh, about eight years ago on uh, on child number one. <laughs> I mean, literally, there's there's no sleep here. If you get yeah, six seven hours a night, you're doing pretty good around here. Well, I'm I'm really excited to have you here. I w I mentioned actually, I usually don't mention any upcoming guests. I certainly don't in public, but I mentioned to one of my friends that I was going to have you on, and uh, he was super excited. You have a, a, quite the cult following among options traders. Um, Everybody loves watching your videos, and I, I've watched hours and hours and hours of them, but um, um, I found actually on one of the options forums that I'm on, I guess one of your guys is on the same forum. I think his name's uh, Matt Williamson, maybe, something like that. Um, yeah. And uh, and uh, so it, it's really great to actually have you on uh, the show uh, live. So um, have, how's the earnings been going for you? Okay. Have you been doing earnings plays? Did you, did you just mention, uh, by the way, you mentioned Matt. So uh, we recently just, uh, we just hired Matt. Oh, really? <laughs> so, yeah, if you, uh, if you name uh, somebody that's been around the options that's more on like the trading side and less like on the, you know, we don't really, we don't hire a lot of people that are like quote unquote well-known, like big voices in the industry. So we've actually been on a hiring spree just recently. So a lot of just these bigger traders that are around, maybe people know him from forums, but it's funny you mentioned Matt. Literally, he's, he's on his third week right now with us. Um, yeah, I just brought him on this summer. It's, uh, it's fun. Fire away, fire away. Sorry. I just, oh, no, that's fine. Well, well, no, there's this, um, this group. Uh, it's like a, a Facebook options group um, asked me to, to help moderate about six months ago. And uh, we get tons and tons of people coming in there all the time. But... I, I saw somebody had put up one of your videos and this guy in the comments said, wait, I'm actually, I actually work for those guys. And that was Matt. And I wasn't actually involved in the comment, but I, I was just reading through it and I saw him there. So I thought it would be uh, a surprise for them to actually post this video on there later on uh, today or tomorrow. Um, I, I was watching one of your um, recent live streams where you kind of were giving your history and some of the new people. Um, it seems like you do a lot of teaching. Now, did your teaching start uh, with uh, Think or Swim? So <clears throat> I started trading in Chicago. Now, I, I grew up around traders. I guess that's where we should start. I kind of grew up around traders. Um, there was a firm that was actually based in Chicago all the way back to the 1970s. The firm was called O'Connor & Associates. Are you, are you at all familiar with it? Yeah, I know O'Connor. O'Connor. Yep. Okay, so... My uncle was the actual founder of O'Connor's. Not one of the O'Connor. I mean, there were two brothers, O'Connor, but they didn't actually build the firm. Um, uh, a guy actually was, he lived here in Scottsdale. That's how I ended up in Scottsdale. He built the firm. Uh, that happened to be my uncle. So I had cousins that traded and was always kind of around it. And that's, that's how I got involved, just a couple of weeks outside of uh, school. Almost like a, a sister firm, if you will, of like Think or Swim that was based here in Scottsdale. It was an education firm. And I originally started just doing a little contract work for him, going out, doing some speaking gigs. I was literally like 23 years old, 
but I knew options, I knew, you know, derivative modeling and so forth, and they liked it. And that's, that's kind of how I got involved. And then Thinkorswim, kind of the sister firm said, you know what, we should build an education model, which is everything is free and free education. That's, that's what I really kicked into high gear. And that was uh, 2003, 2004, when we actually built uh, what was then the education division of Thinkorswim. So uh, let me ask you about that. My, my connection, um, well, let me just tell you this connection is that uh, I was a trader at the SIBO for a long time, and I had friends that were in the OEX pit at that time. And I don't mm -hmm. think I ever met like Tom Sosnov. I think I've met Bat before, but like sure. uh, one of the guys from the OEX pit, uh, this guy, uh, uh, Hunt Hamill, who is a broker for Chicago Core on the right side of the pit, is the guy who first got me on the floor. And I knew like a, a whole bunch of people from the OEX. But um, I imagine when I heard that you were with Think or Swim, I, I was wondering what it must have been like f in the beginning with those guys. H how did you come meet like Tom Sosnoff and those guys uh, uh, way back when? Was it through your connection with your uncle? Yeah, actually, you know what? So it was a connection into Chicago, but I, uh, I had a buddy that was retired out here in Scottsdale who was the very first floor broker ever in the OEX. A guy by the name of Frank Walsh it was uh, FHW Options. I'm sure you know Frankie. Yeah, Everybody yeah. knows Frankie. <clears throat> yeah, I can picture I can picture that guy, yeah. Wow, it, it, it's, it's such a small world of the SIBO and everything. Yeah, so... so Oh wait, I, I lost. I, I lost. I'm I'm losing okay. sound for a second. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. You're fine. Okay, it just twitched for a second. Yeah. So um, so you started actually in Scottsdale and then came back to Scottsdale at the end. Is that what is that what what you're explaining? Oh, a little bit. So yeah, my cousins were already kind of like semi-retired out here, and they were still trading, and they still actually had a couple seats in Chicago, and started going back and forth. And I did that for a period of like 18 months, like just real kind of contract work on the outside. And I was actually trading um, S&P futures with the time was a brand new product was the E-mini. We were trading that against uh, an SPX portfolio. We were doing some one five arbitrage between SPX, OEX, you know, the minis that were initially trading. And that's that's kind of where I got my start. And the best advice I ever got in this business was they said, you got to get out of this, you know, professional trading world. Like, don't even think that you're going to have a career on the floor. Don't move to Chicago. You know, that's that they were adamant. And this is in 98. They go that that floor is going away. So I kind of took it to heart. and I ended up going on to the uh, to the retail brokerage firm. And I had no intention of ever going out and teaching a class. They were just like, you're young, you're stupid. Let's, you know, put you on the road. Here's an expense account. You know, you give a 24 year old a corporate credit card um a little knowledge and a couple of plane tickets and you have a lot of fun sounds like an awesome job getting to fly all, all around the play all around the country so just if you could just give the viewers just like a like a, a, a brief like really quick of how think or swim came together and wh what the structure was like back then of the, of the company so so by the time i got involved in think or swim <clears throat> there was there was probably about uh, 20, 30 associates there. It was, it was just like a OEX, SPX reunion. So you've been on the floor, you realize the degeneracy that goes on <laughs> on a trading floor. Imagine that piled into a very small office. And the first office is like on Lincoln and Ashland, which, uh, you know, not too far from like Wrigley Field, beautiful office, like really very boutique kind of options firm. Nobody knew what we are, who we are. Just had like a, a really just cool, like kind of gritty feel to it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, everybody didn't mind working 12, you know, plus hours a day. I flew around and I was coming back and forth to Chicago because there was development of technology. There was, there was you know, running the business. And there was also the education side, which I ran. So I was flying around doing about 12 classes in different cities a month and going to Chicago. So I was on the road a good 20, 22 days. But uh, again, you know, early Sounds to mid-20s, awesome. single guy. Yeah. And they had me all over the world for, uh, for a period of time. And that was, you know, uh, again, it, was, it felt just like the trading floor. And, you know, people always ask me, you know, when you left, what'd you miss? I'm like, I really missed some of the guys I worked with. I mean, I worked with some really fun guys, and then a couple of them started traveling on the road with me later on, and we had a good time.
So was that was it, what year was that ninety eight? You said around that time or or, or two thousand. So when I when I really started traveling heavily, it's kind of almost like the sister firm of Thinkorswim was in 2000, 2001. And when I was just full bore, like the Thinkorswim platform really rolled out and we rolled out free education, that was 2004. Uh, from 2004 to about 2007, um, that was, again, it was 20 plus days on the road. It was, and again, on the road, partially in Chicago, partially, you know, different cities. Uh, and just seeing the growth of Thinkorswim, it was exploding at the time. Uh, and then, of course, we you know did an acquisition to become public, did a road show for that. It was uh, it was chaos from that point. We got the original Barons ratings. I'll never forget that. I mean, we got rated like number one in Barons. We were more shocked than anybody. They gave us a call like the night before, and they said publishing is coming out. Get ready. You're going to open up. You know, a, a few you know tens of thousands of accounts within a few days. And uh, I guess the, the rest is history from that point on. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I think many of my viewers probably know you from uh, initially from Think or Swim instructional videos. I know that's where I first found you. Um, so what was the original price structure for Think or Swim? I know now it's sort of free through TD Ameritrade, but did you have to pay money monthly for it way back when? Or was it was it attached to commissions or how did it work way back when for for I mean, at the beginning for price? prices for that yeah the thinkorswim platform from day one was free it was oh, okay. totally free totally free data in fact we even did a credit it's funny you mentioned that because i remember that we did a credit if you bought broadband internet and this is going back again like I think 2003 2004 if you had broadband internet i think we gave you like a hundred dollar credit per month so the platform was free and they gave this this credit it was anywhere from 40 to 100 dollars. remember this credit for broadband internet uh, and then it was, you know, commissions. It was like a, at the time, I think it was like about, about a buck fifty a contract, which nobody else was doing. You're like, you could trade one contract and it would cost you a buck fifty. And that sounds like a lot in today's terms, but, um, you know, commissions have become commoditized now, which is a, it's a good thing if you're a retail. Yeah, totally. Totally. And uh, I know that. It, it, commissions have really you really have to kind of fight around these days i think it's always been like that to get a good to get a good deal but so how did thinkorswim what was the business model like how did it make money and it oh so it was com it was just commissions uh and they didn't yep. which brokers did they use to to clear at that time oh at the time we were actually using which was uh penson financial so we were actually clearing through penson financial which is you know i mean a version of it is still in existence today but um, yeah, no, that that hasn't really uh, hasn't changed that much. Obviously, TD Ameritrade moved them away from Pence and Financial um, after after 2008. But um, yeah, no, it was predominantly commissions that really generated the business, and you know, a wing and a prayer that people would really adapt to the technology, which is you know what you still trade on uh, to this day. I'm still you know on Thinkorswim on a day to day basis. Yeah, so I, I use it as well it's a it's an amazing platform um yeah that that's an amazing story um so you w were you like um was it like a big financial thing when thinkorswim got taken over for you did you have like some sort of shares in it or something how did that work was it was it privately owned at the time or did everybody get bonused out or something is that a person i don't know is that too personal a question to ask i mean was it no, was it no, a good no, thing no. for you so I was early, early think or swim, and the way it was structured is uh, they didn't necessarily have any shares, but a couple of us had uh, had a few different deal structures in place. But in the initial acquisition, which was with Invest Tools, um, it was really, really favorable because they said, "All right, we can't lose this guy," and there were great retention bonuses for uh, for a lot of years. And by the time those ran out, that's when TD Ameritrade acquired it. And, and that was even better when TD Ameritrade came around and they kind of scooped us in the midst of the financial crisis. But uh, it was a good buy. It was a good buy on their part. And I stayed there as long as I possibly could, right up until the point, great health insurance. We popped out the third child and I was like, that's it. I'm done with the regulated side of this business. And I hung up the licenses and that's kind of when I exited and started Theotrade. And what, what year was that? 2015 2016 time frame so oh, okay so fairly recently spent, yeah. uh yeah yep we're uh just almost three years now oh that's awesome so what is uh 
what, what was it like working with Tom Sosnoff? Because he seems like an inspirational figure. I've seen, I've, I've watched a couple of interviews with him. Um, was he, did, did he exit kind of right when it got taken over or how did that work with him? Was he actually, the other thing I want to ask yeah. you is just, was he like the main force behind everything or were there a couple partners? Because I'm, I'm not really, I don't really know the, the whole story of Think or Swim. So there was a lot, I, I really think there was a lot more in the background of, of Think or Swim than most people would probably argue. And yes, Tom was, and, and Tom wasn't even so much a figurehead. I mean, it was kind of both of us at the time, because I, I was traveling around a lot, but I didn't have nearly the influence, obviously, on the business that he had, not even close. Uh, um, I was just the individual a lot of the people knew because we were on the software demos and so forth. Um, so Tom and Scott were the primary partners uh, in there. And there happened to be actually a third and silent partner that lives here in Scottsdale, Arizona. Interesting irony, fast forward a couple of years, he's also, he's also the key partner in Theo Trade. Oh. Anyway, the partner out here was also really influential because he's a lot of like the look, the feel, kind of the, uh, you know, the ambiance almost of, of the firm back then uh and his ideas were st are still resonating to this day you know if you look at like what tasty trade is that was, was one of the original partners kind of your industry going is if you don't educate people what's what's the point of even having a trading application and that was always the idea it wasn't it wasn't to be beneficial like oh let's get these people to trade a bunch on the platform and and it was to make people okay recognize what's going on in the business to get them profitable to get them over that learning curve to to make them successful is the only way any brokerage firm is going to survive and it made though the clients incredibly valuable you know like a, a think or swim or td ameritrade client is so much more valuable than somebody that opens an account at like for example like robin hood which is it's free commissions it's free everything you're going to get what you pay for you know, and I've got my own feelings about that one as well. But, you know, free ain't exactly good if the client isn't really learning anything. You know, and that's, yeah. that's a big portion of uh, success. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And also with like putting, having someone start with a Robin Hood where you're, you're extremely limited. I think at one point you could only do market orders and you can't, you could only do, you know, you couldn't do a, a round trip and all these things that these these limiting things, some might say it's good, but if you're just starting out, it's not good, you know, and, and paying a couple extra bucks commission or whatever, or paying a little bit commission uh, is 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 uh, prefer preferable to like being stuck in a trade, not being able to get out or having to pay the market on like a, a you know, a big bid ask or something like that. So, so back to your original question with Tom. Yeah, no, Tom was absolutely like the guiding influence. The one thing that always struck me about Tom and, and the stuff that people really don't know is, you know, we would go out and we would do seven or eight trade shows a year. And this is not early on. This is even like, you know, later on, Thinkorswim is a big company and you're standing there at a trade show and people are just absolutely mobbing you. And it's, it's fun at first, but then it becomes a horrible experience like years later. But if he's willing to stand there you know, for, for eight to 10 hours, you know, how many people actually did that? I, I respect that more than anything that, you know, you ever learned anything. Okay. Anybody that's willing to stand with you and take that physical beating for eight to 10 hours a day and then come back and do it eight, you know, to 10 times a year, then go on the road. I mean, I traveled with Tom for, I don't know, seven to 10 years. I mean, we traveled everywhere together, uh, involved in de everything from, from deals that we had done along the way to the different trade shows to he used to come out and teach a lot of classes. And I think that's uh, to gain the respect of the people that work there, though, is that to me was worth its weight. I mean, I only work with people right now and I only work with, you know, people in the past. You know, you got to be willing to die for it. If you really, you know, if you want a company that's going to be successful, you got to be willing to die for it. And he absolutely was. And that's that's the one thing I think that resonates the most with me. Uh, it sounds like an amazing thing, because I mean, between the brain power of you and him together, you know, uh, in a new adventure and all that, it, it just sounds like it was a really exciting time. And uh, you, you really did. Uh, you really had an amazing accomplishment with Think or Swim, and the the other really impressive thing is that you two are both back at it in your own ways now. You know, after all that success and and everything, you, you're you're still at it and still grinding away, and you're creating uh, more amazing stuff. So it's 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 uh, it's revolutionary for the industry. I think without you and Tom, uh, options traders would still be just buying calls. You know. 
the the concept of selling premium and, the, and all the concepts of just understanding volatility. I was watching um, one of your courses last night, and um, this is stuff that the public is starting to know now, which they didn't know at some point. They had yeah. no idea about some of these, even the most basic concept, and, and you've really taken it to another level with, uh, with Theotrade. Well, let's talk about... Um, Let's talk about your latest company now. So it started about four years ago, would you say? So uh, we actually, we officially launched in uh, 2016, literally January 2016, January 1st, 2016, we were a go. Um, took a little planning. Obviously, I, I left, I only left TD Ameritrade in February of 2015. So by the way, uh, people always ask that. They're like, did you want to take some time off? I tried. <laughs> I tried. I actually, uh, the, my last six months at like TD Ameritrade, I was kind of like being phased out, intentionally being phased out because I was like, all right, I'm going to hang it up. And I had about like, oh, three, four months that was almost completely downtime. And I'm like, okay, this is not going to work. I don't want to end up divorced. <laughs> so I'm going to be throwing my time and effort into something. And that's when uh, a really, really close friend of mine who was one of the original partners in Thinkorswim, and again, he's kind of the silent partner uh, behind it, some of the money behind it and so forth, but he gave me a riskless trade. He said, if you launch another company, we'll stake it. You don't even have to put your own capital at risk. Uh, just bring in somebody that's going to be an expert in marketing, which happens to be my partner now, Jeff Roth, and, and we launched, uh, and we launched Theo Trade. But um, the design of Theo Trade is it's, it's not what people... Like think it is, and that's just about education. Um, we're going much deeper than that here, piece by piece. I have, I can claim a little bit of an O'Connor connection in that I worked uh, for a year for a company called Options Funding, which was a SIBO market maker firm uh, run by uh, sure. these guys, Sevy and Eric. And they were, I think, came out of O'Connor somehow. They cleared O'Connor, I believe, for a little while. And so I have a little bit of a connection to the O'Connor world, which I'm proud of. That we had, we definitely had the uh, the plaid jackets uh, with, oh, yeah. uh, with oh, yeah. the, I don't know if it's Scottish or Irish stripes on them. Most of that stuff really predates me. It just does. It's, it's, you know, I hear about like the stories of stuff that with my uncle and a couple of my cousins on the floor, but it really, most of it actually, actually predates me. I'd say that the, the most I learned in this business, it wasn't even so much like the time in Chicago. For me, it was the time, I mean, spent from, you know, huge hours in an office with, with a couple of traders. It was trading. Um, but the single largest learning curve in trading was after you knew everything, like you knew everything there was to know about options. We got to actually study client accounts, and that's where you really started to learn. Like, if you wanted to refine criteria, if you wanted to refine your trade, you could actually study, you know, tens of thousands of accounts and say, like, if this person did an iron condor, what are the pitfalls? If they did this, what are the pitfalls? And you could actually go back and start doing regression analysis. And when we started to work for TD Ameritrade, we had an entire group i mean you would think of them almost as like actuaries but they're just math geeks and you could ask them any question about pretty much anything trade related and they could spit out an answer within a few days time it was it was insightful that's where the real learning curve uh i guess kind of kicked in for uh, for me personally so did when you look at accounts like that are there a lot of retail people that just blow out is it like 50 percent just losses or is it 90 percent you know how they say like oh 80 percent of people lose money yeah. was there a lot of, a ton of turnover because i know like something like forex is like massive turnover was it similar with what you were experiencing so i do i actually know the exact attrition rates. some of them are you know i have to take some of the attrition rates to my grave but of you course know, the weird thing people they always ask me the question they say you know people that trade options do they make money the thing is that you could not do, so you're looking at a retail brokerage account, people trade stocks, options, and futures all seamlessly. Frankly, I, didn't, I never liked the currency market, and you're exactly right. In the FX market itself, the attrition rate is sky high. Like you don't, people that just trade the outright currencies, okay, but it's a different type of a person, so a lot of that has to do with personality, not necessarily like, you know, it's a bad product. I don't want it to get misconstrued, because I think a lot of people do make 
decent money in the FX market. It just attracted somebody though that would open up an account with a couple of grand and they're a little bit more of like a gunslinger. So when it came down to it though, people ask me that all the time, like the people make money, the people lose money. So you blend the stocks, options and futures. First of all, back in like 2008, yeah, I can say that the vast amount of people were, were taking losses in 08. There was no question because they were long stocks, but a few, okay, and, and a much smaller percentage, they were absolutely killing it, killing mm. it in terms of, you, know, you always get some people that are short and these people trade options. So some people like, you know, just really magnified um, the, the amplitude of that particular move. But then if you look from like 08, to literally right now, for the most part, you threw money at anything and you made money. Hmm. And and that's where, like, again, there's a big misnomer. 80% of people fail? No, not even close. Because right now, it's like 95% of people are making money in the retail accounts. How they're doing it, you know, is different. And again, it's very, it's, it's I shouldn't say very, like, difficult. It's almost impossible to separate the options from the stock because everything, you know, it's not this big zero-sum game. You know, you buy this call. Yeah, well, you're buying a call maybe against a short stock position, and that's very difficult to kind of manage and mirror from the analyticals perspective. Like, when we're looking at an accountant. We don't look at an accountant and say, and again, this is going back years ago. I never looked at an accountant and said, oh, look at Joe Schmo's account. Like, this guy doesn't know what the hell he's doing. You, you had to basket everything together. You had to look at, you know, nothing is statistically significant, and so you start looking at thousands of accounts and there's no better place to look at than i mean they still have the largest option order flow you know td ameritrade does of any brokerage firm uh and that's you know mainly because the thinkorswim platform is is good and they're still you know providing decent education that's why we're still shipping clients off to them as well yeah the the sound is a little clippy can you hear that from your end i i, I hear it just a little bit clipping hopefully it's okay all right, I'll, I'll edit sounds out this okay little spot here. It sounds okay out there. Cool. Yeah, so yep. um, initially, were you, were you looking... I, I know you were looking at those customers to see what was successful and that sort of thing, but it, it, TD Ameritrade was also using that to like manage their risk with Thinkorswim. Is that is that fair to say? Um, so to manage the risk is... I mean, if you look at like the Thinkorswim Analyze tab, <clears throat> to manage risk of all of TD Ameritrade they actually do have like a, a portfolio that can be kind of globally put together. So you can look and say like, who's in Apple right now? You can say, oh, magic software, who's in Apple? And you can actually see like a net delta almost, which is very, very cool. Oh, so wow. you can kind of see like what I call global position risk. And you kind of know, like I, I still remember a position years ago, ironically it was in Las Vegas Sands. It was LVS, it was Las Vegas Sands at the time. And for some unknown reason, there was just monstrous positions. It was not like it was going through big news at the time. It was just monstrous positions. And I remember it kept showing up on the risk sheets like time and time again. This is going back like probably almost a decade. But you, again, you can kind of look at global risk of that position. You know, as a firm. At this point in the interview, uh, we got cut short due to a storm outside. Um, there was no internet service and things got totally cut off fortunately don was nice enough to come back and finish the interview with me about a week later so thanks so much again for watching and let's continue with part two of the interview with don kaufman so i'll just start it right here then all right and thank you once again for joining me back on the short vol show with back with don kaufman after uh, a little bit of craziness last week with the uh, the flooding in the area um we are back so thanks so much don for having patience with uh, the weather and me and agreeing to come back on the show yeah no no problem you know uh ironically uh two nights ago we had massive flooding here 25 minutes and an inch and a half of rain later um, my connection actually went down uh, a little bit yesterday, uh, yesterday morning. So I am uh, I'm right there with you. Well, it's a pretty rare thing for, uh, for, for me. It just happened for those two hours that we were together uh, and that one day, of course. But um, I just want to, I have so many things that I'd like to talk with you about. So I have to try to wrap up this the, uh, think or swim part so we can get to Theo trade. Um, sure. So let's see, where were we before? Um, we were just finishing, I think, talking about your time at Thinkorswim, and we were discussing um, sort of the financing and 
uh, that sort of thing. Um, I did have a question I wanted to ask you just about Thinkorswim in general, um, a specific question about the platform. Yeah. When, when we see time and sales on there, is that, um, I know it's not all time and sales because obviously there's more volume than it can show. Do, is that just the time and sales for TD Ameritrade uh, customers, or how do they filter that? Do you, do you no, know? so the time and sales on there, and, and again, it's been it's been three years since I've been there, so you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully nothing has drastically changed. But the uh, the time and sales is from the consolidated tape, and it's just purchased in a data package like everything else. So when you're a brokerage firm, you have a number of data packages you can purchase. You know, the irony is that there's only a handful of decent data providers, you know, and for the most part, if you look at that a spectrum of like 10 broker dealers, eight of them are probably using the exact same data provider. So uh, yeah, no, the uh, the data in there in time and sales is is predominantly, you know, it's, it's the same S&P Comstock or, you know, um, developer feeds that, that pretty much everybody uses in the industry. Gotcha. All right, so we're up to I'd say about 2002, or no, let's go, let's go to 2015 when 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 Theotrade started 2014. Is that correct? 2015. So uh, okay. we launched in like late 2015. We really we really kicked off and started where the public could actually see us, like in beta, in January of 2016. Oh, and the other question I wanted to ask you from before is, what 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 is your uncle's name that you were referring to? Um, oh, yeah, Mike, uh, Mike. Yeah, so he's uh, Mike Greenbaum, um, okay. fairly uh, fairly quiet individual out here in uh, in Scottsdale, and yeah, again, that kind of I, I think that the, you know, looking back on it, that just got me interested in trading. You know, uh, when you have like a relative in it, and you're like, whoa, they've they've made decent money in this business. Um, growing up as a kid, you know, we used to travel from New York or I lived out in LA. We'd, we'd come out here to Arizona and it would had certain like, you know, allure to it when you're, you know, when you're 13 years old and you see that. And it, I think that always resonated with me and probably got me interested in financial markets. I didn't have a background in, uh, in finance, not at, uh, not at all. Yeah, I was looking um, at some old articles on the O'Connor brothers from like 1982 and stuff the other day, trying to, to, to learn a little bit more about those things. So Theotrade as a concept, um, what is the, the sort of the business model for it? As far as I understand it, it's um, a, a sort of a teaching um, a setup where, where you're, you're teaching people how to trade. Is that? Sure. So when we launched Theotrade, you know, I spent about nine, 10 months outside of TD Ameritrade. But the entire time that it was a TD Ameritrade and it was Think or Swim, I was always watching the progression of education firms in the industry. And what I mean by that, the progression of it is, you know, you get these firms that just sell stuff and sell stuff and it's, it's nonstop and it's, you know, I just never liked that model, that constant kind of sales approach in, uh, in trading. And it's one of the reasons that I stayed at Thinkorswim and TD Ameritrade so long because we were just hammering away at the education industry and the finance world by offering it ultimately for free. But the regulations kind of crack down on you so much at you know the larger brokerage firms. Not it's not necessarily TD Ameritrade. It's Finra. It's the SEC. You know we finally said that's it. You know I've had it. I'm out of here. I'm going to start an education firm. So. I looked at a number of different models, and what we ultimately arrived at is we run a subscription service similar to like Netflix, where we run six hours a day of streaming. So you you know you can actually see not my face, so you don't want to see my face right all day. Um, you actually see my screen, and we're trading. So I do about an hour a day. I've got Matt Williamson does like an hour a day. Jeff Bierman, Jeff Bierman's our technical analyst, does like an hour a day. Uh, we've got Brandon Chapman, who worked like years ago at Invest Tools and eventually got absorbed into TD Ameritrade. He does about an hour a day. Tony Rago is our NASDAQ future specialist. He's doing an hour a day. Corey Rosenblum's a swing trader. And it just goes on and on. We even have um, Slim Steve Miller. Um, and Slim actually does um, some, uh, some contracted work for us as well. So we're stacking more and more traders we're not you know we're not in the business to just sell education um everything we do is 99 bucks uh, a month i've just i've had it with like you know you got to buy an indicator you got to buy this you got to buy that 
and putting that nail in the coffin and doing that. And uh, it's working because, you know, we're, uh, we're well into 2,000 plus members wow. in, uh, in Theo Trade in, you know, just about two, two and a half years. Wow, that's impressive. So um, I think one of the things that's most respected about you and Theotrade by fellow traders that I hear is that you do post your positions and, you know, not every one of them, of course, is a winner, which is actually distinct from so many people out there who are selling this sort of, you know, I, I, I rail up against this all the time, you know, uh, a boot camp from Malibu where every trader makes 200% per right. week and we're all driving Ferraris and we're slapping five and pumping iron and this sort of thing. People, um, I think, really respect you because they've, they've watched you succeed in, on certain setups and they've watched you uh, not do as well on other ones. And it's real. And it's for real. And that's really exciting. Um, do you... Um, when people are making these trades for Theotrade, is, are the actual trade P&Ls part of Theotrade or is it sort of like separate accounts that people people have set up? So we actually have like each one of our traders, they're trading for themselves and they're showing their own account. And that was important to me because I wanted them to, you know, I, I looked at this and I looked at this long and hard. I'm like, I don't mind throwing like a million bucks into an account, letting other people trade it. It's not going to bother me because I know these guys, but then they don't have the skin in the game. Like they have to feel the fear, like on a really big down day, it can't be, you know, a million dollars sitting in an account that isn't theirs. It's got to be their capital. It's got to be, when I say feel the fear, they got to look at it and think to themselves, holy crap, what have I just done to myself? And um, that is a big portion of it. You know, watching one of our traders kind of, uh, how do we say this eloquently, vomit up a position is, <laughs> um, that's, that's the reality of the business. Uh, I've done it live, and so is everybody else. I mean, it's what goes on with traders. It's not all, uh, you know, song and dance, and you're right 90% of the time. Because the other 10% of the time is a hideous beast that waits for you in the dark. So so when someone comes on board with you, you say to them, like, um, we want you trading from your own account actively. Or actually, or does it depend sort of person to person how, how you sort of set thing, things up with people? So, uh, you know, I'm actually pretty vicious on this front. The, uh, the, the way that, that these traders get, you know, to be instructors on Theotrade, again, we don't really hire anybody that's quote unquote like known in the industry. I don't care if they have the biggest name out there. I, I don't want them. I want people with track records. So I usually start by looking at, for example, their track record. They usually have a conversation with them because not everybody that can trade can speak. So a lot of these guys, like I'll give you an example, like Tony Rago. Tony actually is a NASDAQ futures. That's all he trades. He just scalps NASDAQ futures. Um, he's not a big directional person. It's, it's more of like systematic type trading. It's a logic. It's a strategy that he uses. And, you know, I knew about him before I even left TD Ameritrade. He's one of the first phone calls that I make, you know, is, is somebody and, you know, checking out the track record. But it's still like, you know, kind of a brutal upbringing before we make these guys a, uh, a full-fledged instructor. And, you know, we were talking about uh, Matt. Matt is recently come on here. We still call him New Fish. We'll probably call him New Fish for the next year. So a little bit of hazing, a little bit of abuse. Let him know that, uh, you know, you're as good as your uh, your last trade is, is kind of, uh, you know, the mantra around here. All right. Well, let's get on to the the, uh, the most exciting part, which is uh, right now today in the positions. And I know that sometimes those things don't don't age well, but it doesn't matter. I want to talk about it. Um, sure. So you and um, Tom Sosnoff are both sort of uh, when I watch you two, you both sort of like to favor a little short delta here and there. Do, do you think that comes from the same place where I mean, was that the uh, the feeling way back when as well? Yeah, you know what? So with uh, with short deltas, and it, I actually just talked to Tom last week. In fact, I talked to him the same day that, that we talked last week. I think it was Thursday. I happened to talk to Tom just after the close about that, and we were actually chatting about the deltas. We actually have vastly different positions. You know, I'm not quote unquote outright short right now. I'm taking what I call short shots to the downside. I'm using just a number of like ratio spreads. If the market really plummets, I'll do extremely well. But at the same time, I'm not just, you know, outright short a ton of deltas. I am short individual products. And I'm, I'm actually using synthetic shorts. I'm buying like deep in the money puts, little, little distance out in time. And I'm kind of, you know, 
taking a couple of short positions as they come, and those have worked out quite well. But I don't want to get labeled like you know the outright short because I think you know being a bear in a marketplace that has been this resilient, like you're not going to see me right now shorting an Amazon. Although I did yesterday, but it was an intraday trade. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hold on to any shorts in something like Amazon though, or any of the big momentum type techs. Short Caterpillar, short a little bit of Morgan Stanley. I'm gonna cover Morgan Stanley, shift that over to JP Morgan because it's doing faring better on a percentage basis, probably get a better risk reward out of it. Um, I'm short the XHB and have been since uh, beginning of January. Again, I'm kind of you know uh, sniping off a couple of positions as uh, as I go. Um, and so, you were saying you were different than Tom in that way. Um, how would how would you say you're different than him as far as that goes? He's just more of like a a, a long term bear, which it seems like he is yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? So. Absolutely, like a long-term bear, and I've definitely had a bearish tilt for a long time since, for the most part, the Fed started even discussing raising rates. But this is not like it was 10 or 20 years ago. You know, 10, 20 years ago, uh, a guy like me could stand up and kind of, you know, step into the wind a little bit and, you know, and power through a rough position. This marketplace, though, is ripping apart even hedge fund managers with billions. They can't sustain the duration anymore. You know, one of the big sayings that, you know, has been used, it was think or swim even before that was duration over direction. But unfortunately, right now, you can't necessarily stand into the wind. And that's why uh, about a year and a half ago, I really changed up how I'm positioning myself because volatility is so compressed. Volatility is, is just absolutely decimated to the point where eventually it's going to erupt. And when it does, I will be there with uh, a couple of um, positions where I'm looking and I'm actually on the, the other side of volatility. I've been buying volatility, you know, and cheap out of the money options for, uh, for quite some time. I'm financing that with selling other options. And uh, I'll be there when, uh, when we have, you know, a six, 7% or a limit down day. I'm only going to need one. And that's, uh, that's the kind of trades that I'm looking for right now. Well, what do you think of uh, the VIX has really kind of popped in the last day or two um, and not on a very big down move in the uh, the E-minis or, or the markets. It, it, it seems to be spooked somehow. And I, I've watched a couple of your videos, so I might know your answers. But for those who haven't watched your, your videos, why do you think we've gotten such a pop in the VIX the last couple of days? You know, traders probably think alike, you know, so I'm um, and me, I don't even look that much at the VIX. I happen to look at the VVIX, which is the volatility of the volatility index. And I look at it because, you know, anybody who's anybody knows to come in now. They don't necessarily buy SPX puts to hedge, which they're buying those, too, because the skew is actually at the record high today. Um, however, you know, why do I watch the VVIX? Because they're coming in and they're actually buying VIX options. Uh, Reasoning behind it, global, just global currencies are an absolute disaster. I specifically look at like Latin America a lot. I mean, there's a, there's always been a quote on the street since before I've been in this business. You know, we got a peso problem, and that's just a saying that it doesn't have to do necessarily with the Mexican peso, but it's elaborating upon currencies when they start swirling when volatility kicks up in currencies. Okay, listen, that train is never late. That's going to bleed over into U.S. equities. And that's why volatility popped yesterday. Now, whether that comes to fruition is a different story because, again, we've got such efficiency in today's market. Everybody's looking at the same thing. Traders like me, you know, they're all like, oh, oh wait, this currency, you know, they're uh, like, look at the bright, shiny object. It's no longer Turkey. Now it's, you know, South Africa. And uh, soon it'll be like Argentina. Let's go back over there and hammer that currency. But um, the currency movement is of uh, fairly deep concern at this point. Yeah, I'm just looking as we talk. The VVIX is backed off a little bit down to about 102. I think it was up at around, uh, yeah, 107 yesterday. Yep. During that Vomageddon sort of thing, it, it spiked to like 178, just or something around. Maybe it was 200, <laughs> really briefly. But um, I've had a hard time sort of correlating it to, to anything sort of that significant over the last couple of months because it got down to like, low 90s and it was kind of moving around and it didn't it, it didn't seem to be as significant to me to watch as as, as just sort of like the vix the um the short term futures and right. and just the term structure for me the only time 
that the VVIX starts to make sense, when it gets above 110, you know, that's duck and cover. That's, we're gonna see wild intraday reversals. The markets become that much more unpredictable. Also, when the VVIX is that high, that's usually when I step in and start selling a little bit more premium. It doesn't do it all that often. And you were typically in the midst of turmoil already when we're hitting that 110. But once that VVIX gets above 100 though, you start paying attention, you start looking for, you know, these more vast intraday moves. Uh, and that's predominantly how I'm using it. The other aspect you can look at, the VVIX, again, it, it, you can run all the regression analysis you want. You know, the VVIX being elevated, okay, in the midst of volatility, well, it should be, okay? But, you know, a reading, again, on an intraday basis is often telling you how serious are things. You know, should I, should I be under my desk rocking back and forth, or is this, is it all gonna be uh, okay? And a sustained VVIX is even more entertaining, because <laughs> that's, that's traders, keeping the hedges on, buying more hedges, and that's, that's, a, rare, uh, that's a rare occurrence because it's telling you like, is this thing gonna bottom? Are we, uh, are we likely just to keep to uh, vomit the market even further down? Uh, that's the only time though the VVIX gets interesting. I would say that you know, one in 10 times you even look at that thing, is it, is it worth anything? And that's usually when it's cracking the 100, 110 kind of marker. Um, how much do you pay attention to order flow in your um, in your trading calculations? I was I had someone on a couple of days ago who was uh, using a product called LiveVol and actually yep. focusing a lot on options order flow. Obviously, that would sort of come into play with the VVIX, where you try to figure out actually what what they're buying as opposed to just if they're buying. Um, do, do you pay a lot of attention to order flow? I've got some pretty strong feelings at that, and, and I'll tell you why I've got some strong feelings. I watched order flow from the other side of the business for 15 years. You know, the moment that Thinkorswim opened, I could actually sit there and look at a screen, like I could look at a screen every day, and that was your orders pumping through. And by 2007, we were the largest retail options order flow, but a lot of people don't know, Thinkorswim also had a bit of an institutional side, and some of the institutional traders were the biggest option traders in the entire world at one point in time. I mean, they were doing 120,000 contracts a day, just one small group. And so watching the order flow, what a trader is doing, okay, is not dictating their position. If I go out and for example, I bought you know 50,000 SPX calls, uh, come on, I'm not getting long. All right, I'm buying 50,000 SPX calls because I just unloaded an absolute boatload elsewhere. Or, you know, conversely, um, the, the positions are just vastly misinterpreted. You know, and the SPX is the, is the absolute worst, in my opinion, because there's an arbitrage between the SPX, the VXX, the VIX. I mean, you know, how many different ARBs can you look at in different ways? It's like become a Rubik's Cube a little bit. So what somebody is, is doing in one position isn't necessarily dictating what their intent happens uh, to be. I still talk to a couple of traders uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that still work, not not at TD. I mean, I still talk to those people, but uh, on the professional side, some of the some of the people I worked with early on went on to some of the bigger Chicago firms to, to remain un, unnamed and unmentioned, as they're they're usually feeding me. They're like, "We're buying volatility right now," and I'm like, "Why?" They go, "I don't know. The algorithms are just doing it." Um, it's it's kind of ironic. So. The order flow that I look at, though, is more about expected move. I mean, I'm all about like, what are the options saying Friday about the next Friday expiration? And that has held incredible statistical significance. Like, I, I run a lot of p-values and I look at the stats behind this, and that's what holds the most significance right now. I was watching your analysis from a couple of days ago. I think it was of, of the SPX expected order flow and you were talking uh, expected move, and you were talking about how it had almost made its expected move for the week just yesterday. And I was watching uh, I was watching Facebook this morning, and, and the thing was whipping all over the place too. Um, yeah. yeah, there's some you know it, w traders like it when we get a market like today where stuff is actually happening for a change. It seems like there was sure. nothing happening for a while. Um, well, listen, I, um, like I said, people are huge fans of yours in the fact that y you do lay it out there, you do take positions on, and sometimes they go against you, and, um, and we get to see what happens then, which is the most really exciting part to me for any trader is how, how they handle things going against them because as beginners, people think that like, the pros never have stuff go against them, but that's right. not true at all. 
You know, it's and that is absolutely the case. I, I can tell you also, you know, I've, I've been uh, a little bit on the market making side of the business. On the market making side of the business, it's not even trading. It's just watching over your computer, rubbing the magic box and, you know, they're trying to capture a fraction of a penny and do it tens of millions of times a day. But uh, no, real traders have real positions and they go against them real big. You know, if you're, you're new to this business, the best piece of advice you give you, you know, you got to stay small. You've got to stay small. You got to trade well within your realm. And if you're feeling like, ah, you know, this is working, but I'm not making enough money, good. That's where you want to be. And that's when you can start to amplify a little bit of size. Size is easy. Size comes later. It's it's breaking through that learning curve. And quite frankly, you know, it's not going to be instant coffee, instant tea. Things are efficient today. You know, you got to spend a year at least in this uh, in this business before you're going to get good at it. So, how would somebody get hooked up with uh, your firm in TheoTrade if they were uh, if, if they were uh, just starting out and wanted to get involved? Yeah, so we have you know obviously YouTube videos that we're doing day in and day out. Some of the YouTube videos can be a little bit deep. We try to keep it at a fairly you know high level. So there's some background knowledge on our site about that. It's just TheoTrade.com. We're really very nonchalant about going out and signing up members. I kind of feel like. Most of the people that come to us, and again, we've got 2,000, like 500 or 2,600 members on there. Most of them, I feel like they've been through the gamut of other educational like garbage out there and trying to be a little bit of a breath, uh, you know, of, of fresh air. We don't want to sell you anything. You got to sign up for 99 bucks a month. We don't want to sell you anything because you've got to trade. And by the way, we also, we do discounts with different brokerage firms and so forth. Um, we figured out we had to charge something. But at the same time, you know, it's it's about a good environment for clientele. We answer emails. You know, we're constantly interacting with uh, with our clientele in the chat room. It's about getting through the learning curve. You know, all the studies, the archives. We actually have right now um, just under six thousand hours of archived material oh, wow. in there. Which nobody could watch all of that, but it streams and it's it's available and actually we're launching a mobile application uh, this month to which they'll be able to uh, to stream content either online or you hop in a plane, you can actually watch recorded courses and so forth, just to, again, to make it easier on, uh, on people. And we're just did um, 10 million minutes streamed in okay. the, uh, the last uh, six weeks. Um, so it's really like the amount of uh, a video that people are consuming, it's incredible right now. Why is it that you have your uh, comments disabled on YouTube? Oh, on YouTube, you know what? Just to keep the uh, the hecklers off there. I, I actually get quite infatuated with that stuff and it's to save my own time. It's funny you mention that because I've actually argued with myself on that front. I, uh, I cannot stand some of the comments that come on there and uh, the internet trolls. So I was spending a good 45 minutes every day and I'm like, I'm gonna go after this one, you know? And then you realize like, ah, you know, that's, that's I'm wasting my time over here. I'm spinning my wheels for, uh, for a troll. And it's, that, was, that was never my intention. But um, by the way, all the comments you want, we have a, a chat room that's doing uh, a few million messages a month right now. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's funny you say that because I, I've noticed that even as sort of like a beginning YouTuber, like I'll get, you know, 500 good comments. And then the one guy that says, like, you're an idiot, you know, it sits in my head and it drives me crazy. Yeah. And I just got to not look at those. You know, it's like you and, gotta, and you got to tell you, I have really, really thick skin. But I think for somebody that's brand new and they're coming on there and they don't really understand it, you're, you know, you're all of a sudden you're in like a volatility argument with somebody. And I'm like, wow, this is just taking up way too much time. And I do actually uh, enjoy it. People email me. Um, we use a general inbox to support at theotrade.com. I'd rather shoot them an email. It's, um, you know what? I also, I'm not big into Twitter. I absolutely cannot stand it. You know, we happen to have a Twitter account for Theotrade. We don't even tweet. Um, you know, when it comes to Facebook, uh, I'm disgusted by that thing. It's traffic is 50% since 2016 and the stock is up, you know, a few hundred percent, but that's a whole different story. Um, by the way, that's why I'm short right there. Why does nobody look at statistics like that? Yeah, I think that Facebook's had some statistics come out just recently where like they're, they're way off. 
I, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. No, the traffic is down 50% since 2016. <laughs> and, uh, oh, it's an outright buy. Like the analysts are still, uh, still buying the stock, just being sarcastic as, uh, I would like to short that thing with both hands all day long, but it's a momentum, you know, the fundamentals, yeah. the fundamentals of markets are not what they were a couple of years ago. Well, it's the same with like a Tesla, you know, it has like no earnings and it's a popularity contest in a way that the stock market in a certain regard. Well, listen, um, I, I really appreciate you spending a little time with me and actually coming back a second time. It's amazing. I, ever since I started my channel, I've wanted to have you on because you, you've been an inspirational figure to me and I, I eat up your videos. And I, I, I know I speak for a lot of other people who really, really love your content. So thanks so much for continuing to do it and uh, keep it up. It's re we, uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it, Dave. All right. Well, uh, good luck in the market in the next couple of days moving forward. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you next time on The Short Vol Show. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for doing that. Um, no problem. No that problem. was awesome. And I love the, the first interview as well, learning about that initial stuff with uh, Thinkorswim and everything. That was really interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I appreciate it. And I'm, I'm all set up now for TD Ameritrade TV here. So it worked awesome. out perfectly. All right. Awesome. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye.